Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and every single week we are adding a few more emotional tools to the emotional toolbox. This, after all, is a program for people who want to learn more about their interiors. Hi, Jenna Lejeune. It's so good to see you. Nice to be here, too. I'm so excited about our guest today. I have to remind people that Jenna is a doctor because uh, there is a lot of times where people say, why don't you introduce Jenna in a more professional way? I'm like... (laughs) I don't know what more I need to do except say she's my groovy co-host. The only time I use the doctor title is when I'm talking with an insurance company. And then it sort of seems <laughs> like perfect. maybe I have this fallacy that like, oh, I I get like on a different hold line than everybody else does if I use the doctor title. I don't think it's actually true, but it makes me feel better. Yeah. So, Jenna, I, if all I took credit for on this show was just bringing in the people who I think are the most fascinating, I think we would have succeeded, don't you? Because I do. today Today, I will guarantee you, you'll come away going, wow, who's going to be next week? Because she was cool. Laurel Breitman, she's anthropologist. (laughs) My work here is done. (laughs) Exactly. And an anthropologist of science. She's the first writer in residence and the director of writing and storytelling at the Medicine and the Muse program at Stanford University. And uh, you're just one of those dummies who went to MIT and had nothing going on, didn't know what you were going to do in your life. And so you're out here in Portland, what, just wandering around trying to be a barista? Is that what's happening? I actually would never get a barista job in this town. (laughs) No, you definitely would not. Right. That's right. There's no way I wouldn't get any job here. Uh, Everyone is too qualified for everything in Portland, I feel like. So you have two areas of study, both that fascinate me. So I want to ask you, which would you prefer to start out with? Your work on um, animals and mental health or your work with uh, physicians and having them learn empathy through writing. Because uh, I'm going to spend some time on both. Well, thank you. You know, honestly, I think they're the same thing. I mean, I don't want to offend uh, any possible physician or medical student that could be listening, but we're all animals. <laughs> yep. There's the human uh, yeah, that's right. and the so, Oh, that's good. But then so that's... I really don't think they're all that separate. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my entry then, because you fell in love with a guy named Oliver. And it sounds like it was one of the best relationships that you've ever had in your lifetime. Tell us about Oliver. Sure. Oliver was like one of the many kind of unstable uh, males that have captured my heart over the course of my life. Uh, Just so happened he was a Bernie's mountain dog. Um, And he really upended what I thought about animals and uh, what I was capable of and my own emotional life and the emotional life of other animals. I was raised on a ranch. Um, I always had animals and dogs and I knew they had like their own emotional quirks, but I didn't know that they could be mentally ill. And then I adopted this rescue dog and he really turned my and my ex-husband's life upside down. How did you first recognize that he was way different from other dogs? Uh, there was kind of like a honeymoon period, like in any new relationship. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then, Been there? Yeah. And then slowly people and other creatures start to show you who they really are. And like like many human relationships, I think I ignored some of the earlier signs just because I loved him and I wanted it to work out. And also I wanted to be the kind of person who could like adopt a dog and heal them and myself in the process. And uh, then he just started to fall apart. So he like ate things that weren't food, like stuff out of the recycling bin. Um, We couldn't leave him alone. He would like destroy like a solid oak wooden door if he was left alone for too long. Um, He would really do anything, including hurt himself to try and get free, even if he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't, it wasn't like he was locked up. Like freedom to him was just being around a person he knew. Um, and so he he had what is known in animal circles as a separation anxiety. But I didn't know what that was. I'd, I'd never come across it before. And then when I had, it was like, oh, okay, like we can't leave our dog alone for a little while. He gets anxious. But I'd never, first of all, I hadn't had like a 150 pound dog. Yeah. And I didn't know what they were capable of. And I had never seen anxiety like this. Actually, I mean, even in another person. Wow. Wow. So is was it at that point that you began your research into the mental health of the animal kingdom? Yeah, it was it was kind of two things. So first it was how on earth do I help this dog? And um one, the kind of like big moment where I realized we had to deal with this was that he 
he jumped out of our apartment, which is was three and a half stories above the ground. He like pushed a window air conditioning unit out of the way. He chewed a hole in the screen and then he fell like 55 feet onto cement and he lived, which was a miracle. And I took him to the pet hospital and they were like, well, you need to move to a first floor apartment. I was like, oh, really? You know, and then they gave me a Prozac prescription for him that was like liver flavored and chewable. And I was like, <laughs> what is this? Uh, does this work? And I had to go to like Walgreens to fill the prescription and they called out his name like Oliver Braitman, your prescription is ready. And I went up to the window and I was like, you guys, this is a dog. Like, do you know this? And they gave it to me in like privacy packaging so that he wouldn't be embarrassed. And they were like, oh, you have no idea. Like this happens all the time. Like we do it for cats and parrots and other dogs. And I thought this was just one of the weirdest things. And I wanted to know how all these drugs got into veterinary practices. And I immediately went home and went online and started looking around and I couldn't find out. And right about at that time, I was starting graduate school and I was reading a lot of Charles Darwin um, in my graduate program, which was History and Anthropology of Science. And Charles Darwin was writing about animals who got depressed and were surly and anxious and... uh, I I thought, my God, like, this sounds like what this vet is telling me. What happened in the intervening 150 years? Like, why is this news to me? Someone who studied biology as an undergrad and, you know, worked doing biology work. And it seemed like cutesy anthropomorphism. Um, But here was Charles Darwin who'd given us the theory of evolution who was like – telling us that this was a real thing. So that's how it started. I want, um, you you came to some, I thought, stunning conclusions based on loving Oliver through his mental health crisis. Um, I want to talk just about how you would equate the lessons you learned in dealing with Oliver with, say, a human being that you might have been in love with. Well, uh, it's not so different. Um, You know, and I think all of the things that helped or hurt Oliver are also the same things that help and hurt in our own journeys towards like healing and wellness when it comes to um, emotional and mental health challenges. And I would say that, you know, for many animals, including Oliver, sometimes the Prozac and the antidepressants and the anti-anxiety medications worked. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes um, exercise and a mixture of like Prozac, and he also had like a debilitating fear of thunderstorms. Um, So like the Valium for thunderstorms would work for like a few months and then it would stop working. And I just know so many people who have a similar relationship to psychopharmaceuticals. Like there's no absolute magic bullet. There's things that help. They help for a while, then they stop helping, and then you've got to figure it out again. I think it's, you know, what I learned through my work with my own dog and then lots of other creatures and people was just that, oh my God, like it's it's a lifelong project. You never know what's going to work. You have to constantly be looking around and seeing what's going to help. And and also you can't have any self-judgment when something stops working. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the end, I really wasn't able to help Oliver. I was able to help him for short periods of time. Yeah. Um, but I never could lift his anxiety. And I, I tried everything. And I think that's what I came away with, too. And after the book came out, I think I've heard from, like, every person in America who's disappointed another human being or an animal they've loved, mm-hmm. which is, like, there's so many of us. And no matter what we try, some Sometimes we can't try hard enough and we we cannot save the other creatures and people that we love. I just love that. Um, I mean, I think probably Jenna listening right now, you're like, yeah, if we could just have this in a therapy session. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I would even extend that to like we can do I I love your empathy and compassion for Oliver and all critters, human and non-human. Um and we can do a ton to try and alleviate the suffering of other beings. And, you know, the Buddhists got this right. Like, life is suffering. Like, it is going to show up. And if what we do when we fail either to alleviate our own suffering or the suffering of another being that we love is we add more suffering by, like, beating ourselves up about that, like, that's probably not, like, the most helpful or compassionate response. Like, that is part of the cycle. And then you do what you can do to try and figure out, okay— what can I do to alleviate some of the suffering, either mine or somebody else's? It's a, it's such a wonderful um, just segue into the work that you're doing now because you're working with medical students and people who are going on. To, are they already doctors, some of them? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so some of them are already practicing physicians, and their whole gearing 
is to try to alleviate suffering, alleviate suffering, and they themselves are probably suffering a great deal and unwilling to share it, to talk about it, to admit it for a whole host of reasons. Will you talk about what the reasons are, why, the, why doctors in particular are so reserved around their suffering? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not a physician. So, you know, also, I'm glad we have a real one here. Oh, um, no, no, no. Not a real doctor. Sorry. Also a fake doctor. Oh, doctor, doctor of psychology. ideas. No, doctor of ideas. Know. Absolutely. We know just enough to be really dangerous. Exactly. I tell people if it's above the shoulders, I know something about it. Below the shoulders, probably don't ask. Me too. I'm like, I can talk to you about your problem. Uh, exactly. Very great. I can help you come up with metaphors about yeah. your problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, for First of all, I, so I was uh, raised on an avocado ranch with lots of animals and also by a doctor. And my father was maybe patient zero in this world for me, where I think he was a frustrated writer. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon um, and a rescuer of animals. And I think had he been able to do it again, he loved medicine, but he would have been a writer. And my whole childhood was suffused with both stories of how hard medicine was. He really hated the rise of the HMO and felt like his relationships with his patients were really changing. And he got into medicine because he really wanted to treat whole people. He wanted to know about their lives. He wanted to be able to charge what they could afford, even for surgery. And he was always getting into fights um, with insurance companies in the hospital. So I grew, grew up really hearing stories of a frustrated physician um, who felt like the reasons he got into medicine were really changing and that the rug was being pulled out from under him in a lot of ways. Like he trained for one thing and then he was forced into a type of practice um, where he really wasn't able to connect always with his patients in a mm. way he wanted to. And that led him to be really frustrated with the practice of medicine. And so I, I've come into this work now. My next book is about humans um, and medicine. It's a kind of a memoir project uh, mixed with a bit of reporting. And I wanted to skulk about a hospital. And the reason I love Stanford was because they had a medical humanities program um, embedded inside the medical school, started by this just incredible woman, Audrey Schaefer. She's an anesthesiologist and a poet. Oh, wow. And she started the Medicine in the Muse program 15 years ago because she felt like the humanities made her a better physician mm -hmm. and that we really can't train future doctors by just giving them multiple choice tests like they see on their boards and everything else, that rarely is the practice of medicine black or white, mm -hmm. that it's always a gray area. There's almost never just one option. There's never one right answer. And she felt that the humanities were and, and the arts really were fields that teach you that there's no run, one right way to, like, read a poem or view a work of art and that we should be training our healthcare providers in that vein, too, that that would equip them um, better. So in any case, I heard about this. I thought this was amazing. She said, great, like I'd love a writer to hang around. And I thought, oh, wonderful. I'll be able to work on my book and um, learn about medicine and go to bioethics meetings at the hospital and it'll be really fun. Um, and I started teaching kind of in exchange for them letting me stay there. And I started leading these writing workshops for medical students and then drop-in workshops for everyone in the hospital community. So physicians, residents, fellows, chaplains, nurses. Um, it's a wonderful mix. And, you know, I was excited because I thought I'd get a lot of stories and essays and poems about, like, nerves of the face or, like, <laughs> bowel obstructions. Those are so great. Oh, man, the bowel obstruction sonnets. Oh, those are awesome. But isn't that fun? I mean, I just think, like, I, I like, really respect MFA programs, but I never went to school for writing. And I felt like more than just teaching young writers who know how to really write, that it'd be fun to teach people who just have so much material but don't know how to write yeah. necessarily. And yeah. so I got those. But then I started to get so many essays about people who were really suffering. And it was, like, almost as if you would just, like, jostle someone or touch them lightly. So all of these stories would come out about, like, the insane pressure on them um, to succeed. And and uh, how they felt like they couldn't be vulnerable in front of everyone. It's really true for physicians, right? Because, like, we live in such a litigious society. Like, they yeah. actually mm -hmm. cannot admit mm -hmm. to a mistake. Yeah. Like, they cannot take public credit often. Um, and so there's just so much pressure on people to be a kind of, like, superhero, godlike rescuer. Um, and I think we've, we've stumbled into this world where there's really no incentive for our healers to be healthy. Wow. And that's so dangerous. And I found that just because I was getting all of these personal essays. And I was 
I couldn't not pay attention. You yeah. Know, they weren't really writing about the nerves of the face. They were writing about, like, their suicidality and they were writing about their anxiety disorders and the fact that they wanted to, like, drive two hours to get an appointment with somebody that they might not know um, because they couldn't have their therapist be somebody who was going to be their psychiatry attending two years later. Wow. It you know, Jenna, career. we were having a, a discussion about that. It, like, there's actual rules around mm. reporting, right? Yeah. And that you're required if a friend who was also a psychologist told you that they were having an anxiety or a depressive disorder, you would actually have to report them? Yeah. So <gasps> this is this is an Oregon state, a newer Oregon state statute. Um, I have a loving name for it called the Big Brother Statute. But it, yeah. is, it is this idea that any mental health professional, including myself as a psychologist, is, su- is supposed to report to the other provider's board if I feel like they are impaired, struggling to the point where they're impaired in any way. And that makes sense kind of on the surface. Of course, nobody wants an impaired healthcare provider. But what it happens is it makes it so that if I'm a human being and I'm sitting there and in this point in my life, I'm having thoughts of, harming myself or I'm having thoughts of being super depressed or I'm having panic attacks. Now, who do I talk to about that? Because I'm so scared that I'm going to lose the only thing that is giving my life meaning, my job. And so I just think we do this thing of like trying to put our healers up on this pedestal where you all have it figured out Mm -hmm. and you don't suffer from the same thing I suffer from. So you'll be able to fix me. And we and I think that is a disservice to the quote unquote patients. And I think that's a disservice to the quote unquote healers. Do you know, is it the same for not just psychologists, but for it, regular physicians? It is. It's for all wow. health. It, at least, I mean, don't quote me, so don't sue me. Again, litigious society. But I believe in Oregon, it's all mental health um, and maybe even allied health providers, because I think it includes like massage therapists and things like that. Yeah. I just had an interview with a woman whose physician husband, really well regarded up on the hill, ended up jumping off a third floor parking structure Mm. because he could not access help. He Mm -hmm. could not, within the structure of his practice, tell people that he was suffering. And I think there's probably also something there about the godlike nature of the role itself, isn't there? Have any of the students spoken about that? Yes. You know, and I think different specialties have different reputations, you know, and there's kind of stereotypes, particularly about, say, surgeons or, yeah. you know, a few other kinds of specialties. But it's really true, I think, across the board. And I really see it in my students, right? Because let's say you're a medical student and you're diagnosed with bipolar, you're, you're bipolar too, like you really cannot talk about that or you risk your residency applications in a lot of places. And I I think that that is so insanely unfortunate because so many of these students actually will be better, better doctors um, because they have been through the system on the side of the patient already. They are full of empathy. They've actually like done a lot of work on their own medication regime, right? I mean, they know so much more about what they're talking about. And if we cut off that ability for them to become physicians, I think it's a giant, giant loss. And and I'm not saying, you know, I, I... I don't want a dangerous neurosurgeon, right? Like, yeah, I, I, of course. Yeah. Like, we <laughs> need to have things in place uh, yeah. so our healthcare providers are not uh, working in a way that could harm their patients. But I think pu- punishing them for seeking out care is the absolute worst way to do it. I think it's actually more dangerous um, because you are more likely to get a healthcare provider who needs help but who hasn't sought it out. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. You uh, were talking, or today sent me a very brief description of some of the of the ground rules in the classroom that I think are such beautiful ground rules for anybody who's trying to write, but they're specific to doctors because they've been, uh, they've grown up in this kind of rubric of how they're supposed to see the world. So will you talk about those just a little bit? Sure. I feel like when, what I teach, first of all, is like very basic, but it's stuff that I had to learn too, because I actually didn't come up being a writer. You know, I was an academic and I was just like too well behaved and sitting inside of a box for most of my life. And so learning how to be a writer that would actually engage other people is still something that I struggle with because being vulnerable on the page is hard for me. It's like the opposite of an academic voice, right? 
right? Where yeah. it's like that all-knowing third person, you know, the beaker was mixed. It's like, wait, <laughs> who mixed the damn beaker? Like, I know you did it. Your name is at the top of this paper. Um, you know, you're like not even allowed to have the first person. Like my PhD wow. dissertation, there there could be no I in it. And, uh, you know, so I would spend like half my time doing that. And then I would like put on my like I'm a writer for a public audience hat. And I had to like unlearn everything I had just done in order to like pass my general exams. And so teaching inside of a medical school and teaching physicians is so similar to my own internal process, which is like, listen, like I know you're here because you've won every fellowship, because you've gotten an A on literally everything you've ever done. (laughs) You are a pleaser. You would not be sitting here. Now I need you to like forget all of that because in order to engage somebody and make them feel feelings, you have to be vulnerable on the page, even if you're not writing about yourself, even if you're writing about something else, Um, that the way to do that is to undo a lot of what got you here, right, into this, like, very prestigious elite little classroom. Yeah. Um, That all those skills that served you to get here are the things that are going to make your work really boring and inaccessible to other people. And if you want to do this work, you have to figure it out. Um, So really, it's that, you know, and like making them feel comfortable enough to do it. Um, which in my case, uh, you know, involves getting them out of the medical school, out of the hospital. Um, Every year we rent out um, two different organic farms. Uh, We bring people to a place called Soul Food Farm in Vacaville. It's like about an hour and a half uh, from Stanford. And I make them camp um, and uh, eat food. And uh, (laughs) that'll make you vulnerable. (laughs) It it does. It does. And they like end up, you know, there's one bathroom. It's like uh, in this like great little structure and they end up having great conversations while they're just standing outside waiting for the bathroom and they see each other like in the early morning and late at night and it's it's nice. Um, You know, they end up having conversations first about identity and their experiences before they end up talking about like, well, what year are you in medical school and what's your specialty? And, Uh um, you know, I try to keep those conversations uh, at a minimum and instead talk to them about like, what's your story? Like, why are you here? I want to talk about how... um, necessary, actually being able to put your experience on the page or speak about it is to learning empathy. Jenna, you use it in your practice a lot, I know, right? I do, yeah. And even though I use it in my practice a lot, I was just thinking, I just finished this book with my um, partner. It's a book about values for professionals. So, you know, and this is something I have a tremendous heart for. And when I was writing the proposal, you know, you have to write a sample chapter And I spent so long on this sample chapter, and I thought I looked so fucking smart in this sample (laughs) chapter. And I give it to my partner, and he reads it, and he's like, what the hell is this? I'm like, what? Isn't it good? Isn't it accurate? And he's like, yeah, but like... Like, this isn't your story that, like, you have to put your heart on the page. So, like, it was profound. It is profoundly scary to have a professional book, like, to other mental health professionals. It'd be different if it was for the public, but other mental health professionals, and it's written in the first person. It's like my voice. There are, like, my stories in there. It is a really, really scary thing. And I would say the thing, like, with my clients where I have really screwed up for many years and I'm like I I still screw up at times around this is you know I'm a psychologist so you know that's one of the squishy sciences right and so I sort of knew like oh I'm a therapist I'm supposed to be human blah 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 but I had this story oh but I'm supposed to be like the now evolved human where I've got it all figured out I used to have the problems you had but now I've got it figured out and I don't have those anymore and so you know I work with a lot of people with um, body image difficulties and so I used to talk with my folks my clients about like yes you know I too used to struggle with my body image (laughs) and I'm like what the fuck like like as if I woke up this morning and now I'm super happy that I have this curvaceous body? No. And so now it's kind of the place of like, yeah, I used to really hate the body that I was born in. Now, if I got to choose, of course I would choose Gwyneth Paltrow's body. I just like that body better than the body I'm in. But I'm not struggling with it quite as much. It's not that I like my body any better, folks. Oh, my God. And what a beautiful, helpful place to actually make people realize we're all going to probably struggle with the body we've been given. Probably. If you have a body. I will tell you, probably Gwyneth Paltrow does, too. I know. I know. know And when I I realized Maybe more than the rest of us. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, um, 
what is, what's been the most memorable type of writing that's come out of this experience? Do you, have you had one experience where you felt like, oh, this, this work is meaningful? Uh, you know, I didn't want to be a teacher. Like, I, yeah. I really thought, like, uh, teaching, writing, I don't want to be offensive here, but this is what I thought, was, like, what writers did if they couldn't pay their bills with writing. <laughs> and I just felt like, oh, oh, like, if I have to do this, I'll do this. Um, but the way I kind of lucked into it, you know, was teaching these workshops, and now I do some classroom teaching. But uh I would say rather than like one student essay that like broke me open or something, although there's been a lot of those, uh, it's just been the experience of what it's like to watch students who didn't consider or physicians consider themselves writers now see them like all just like, you know, out of the corner of my eye at a social event at the medical school, like I'll see one of my students introduce themselves as a writer. And that is just like an incredible feeling. I think it's one of the great gifts of my life. And, I, you know, I, or I, I was talking to a student a few weeks ago and he came to my office and he was like, you know, it's just great. Like I just, you know, I'm one of the a couple people here where I just didn't really realize I was a writer until I came to medical school. <laughs> I was like, oh, my so God. Awesome. Do, you, do you think these people will go on and be able to have better patient conversations and be able to see themselves in a different way where Jenna has said, you know, she's evolved to this place of being able to say, I'm in this soup with you. Will, will they do the same thing? God, that's what I hope. And, you know, we've been doing a little bit of studies of this. And I think that people are pretty transformed by these experiences. And I hope that they will carry that forward as physicians. I haven't been doing it long enough to be able to tell you like five years out, their practice will be different in this and that way. But I think you're right. And I love your point, Jenna, about like, we're all in this together. At the same time, you know, someone's coming to you for advice. So like, you do have to hold that. But also like some admission that like you too have done this, I I think is really important and smart. And I think, you know, what shocked me the most too was that like medicine is storytelling and I didn't realize that. So every time you walk into a physician's office, right, the good ones are say like, so tell me about why you're here today. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about how you got here. Yeah. Um, And my students pointed that out to me long before I realized it myself, which is just like, hey, we're being taught to do a patient interview. Right. Um, We're being taught to find out exactly what brought them here today and the exact ways they're suffering and when it started and everything else. And so really those are very similar to the good skills of journalism. Yeah, and that, so I cool. think, is what ties into your earlier work about non-human animals, at least for me that's what I think about, is like in the non-human animal medical world of things, that's where we start. We start with, oh, your your dog or your cat is having this problem – Tell me about their life context. Tell Mm, me all the things that are going on. Not, oh, okay, let me grab my prescription pad and, like, do the first thing to, like, make that That behavior stop, right? And so for our audience, like, you know, most of y'all are not physicians, right? But what if you could take sort of this lesson of learning to ask about the story Mm. of the people that you love and yourself, like, Be curious about what that story tells you and then be willing to share that story as a way to connect. It's so so beautiful. That's the place I'm going to end it. Laurel, so good to see you. And for people that are going to be able to hear this today, you're in town to do a pop-up, right? Uh, Yeah, it's called Pop-Up Magazine. It's at Revolution Hall. And the show is tonight at 730 and then tomorrow at 730. Okay, I'll be there. Say hi if you do. This is Beyond Well. Thank you so much.